Well, hello there, and welcome to day 12, the last day of the 12 days of Craftlet 2023. My name is Heather Ordover. I am the host of the Craftlet podcast. If this is new to you, we have the previous 11 days for you to listen to all Christmas stories, Christmas stories you probably never heard before, but that I think you're going to like. If you have been listening to the 12 days of Craftlet so far, welcome back. Thank you for sticking it out. And I hope you really enjoy the ending of The Nutcracker and the Mouse King. There is one phrase that gets used in here that gets used enough that I thought something's weird with this. It doesn't make any sense. Drosselmeyer is going to repeat kind of muttering, stupid pack, stupid pack. And that made no sense to me. I have a feeling that pack at the time was some kind of slang in Victorian era speech because the actual translation from the German was stupid nonsense or stupid simple-minded nonsense. So every time you hear stupid pack, Drosselmeyer is commenting on just how lame what is happening is. And that's it. All right. I am not going to slow you down. Let's get to it. Here is the end of The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, written by E.T.A. Hoffman. Chapter 10. The Uncle and Nephew. If any one of my good readers has ever had the misfortune to cut himself with glass, he knows how it hurts and how long a time it takes to heal. Whenever Maria tried to get up, she felt very dizzy, and so it continued for a whole week, during which time she was obliged to remain in bed. But at last she became entirely well, and could play about the chamber as merrily as ever. Everything in the glass case looked prettily, for the trees, flowers and houses, and beautiful puppets stood there as new and bright as ever. But best of all, Maria found her dear nutcracker again. He stood on the second shelf and smiled upon her with a good, sound set of teeth. In the midst of all the pleasure which she felt in gazing at her favourite, a pang went through her heart when she thought that Godfather Drosselmeyer's story had been nothing else but the history of the nutcracker and of his quarrel with Lady Mouserings and her son. She knew well enough that her nutcracker could be none other than the young Drosselmeyer of Nuremberg, Godfather Drosselmeyer's agreeable, but now, alas, enchanted nephew. For that the skilful watchmaker at the court of Pearly Pat's father was the counsellor Drosselmeyer himself. She did not doubt for an instant, even while he was telling the story. But why was it that your uncle did not help you? Why did he not help you? complained Maria, as it became clearer and clearer to her mind, that in that battle which she saw, Nutcracker's crown and kingdom were at stake. Were not all the other puppets subject to him? And is it not plain that the prophecy of the astronomer has been fulfilled, and that young Drosselmeyer is prince and king of the puppets? While the shrewd Maria explained and arranged all this so well in her mind, she believed, since she had seen Nutcracker and his vassals in life and motion, that they actually did live and move. But that was not so. Everything in the glass case remained stiff and lifeless. Yet Maria, far from giving up her conviction, cast all the blame upon the magic of Lady Mouserings and her seven-headed son. But if you are not able to move or to talk to me, dear Master Drosselmeyer, she said aloud to the Nutcracker, yet I know well enough that you understand me and know what a good friend I am to you. You may depend upon my help, and I will beg of your uncle to bring his skill to your assistance whenever you have need of it. Nutcracker remained still 
and motionless. But it seemed to Maria as if a gentle sigh was breathed in the glass case, so that the panes trembled, scarce audibly indeed, but with a strange sweet tone. And a voice rang out like a little bell. Maria, mine, I'll be thine, and thou mine, Maria, mine. Maria felt, in the cold shuddering that crept over her, a singular pleasure. Twilight had come on. The doctor, with Godfather Drosselmeyer, entered the sitting room, and it was not long before Louise had arranged the tea table, and all sat around, talking cheerfully of various things. Maria had very quietly taken her little armchair and seated herself close at Godfather Drosselmeyer's feet. During a moment when they were all silent, she looked up with her large blue eyes in the counsellor's face and said, I know, dear Godfather Drosselmeyer, that my nutcracker is your nephew, the young Drosselmeyer of Nuremberg, and he has become a prince, or king rather, as your companion, the astronomer, foretold. All has turned out exactly so. You know now that he is at war with the son of Lady Mouserings, with the hateful Mouse King. Why do you not help him? Maria then related the whole course of the battle, just as she had seen it, and was often interrupted by the loud laughter of her mother and Louise. Fred and Drosselmeyer only remained serious. Where does the child get all this strange stuff in her head? said the doctor. She has a lively imagination, replied the mother. In fact, they are nothing but dreams caused by her violent fever. That story is not true, said Fred. My red hussars are not such cowards as that. If I thought so, swords and daggers, I would make a stir among them. But Godfather Drosselmeyer, with a strange smile, took little Maria upon his lap and said in a softer tone than he was ever heard to speak in before, Ah, dear Maria, more power is given to thee than to me or to the rest of us. Thou, like Pearlypat, art a princess born, for thou dost reign in a bright and beautiful kingdom. But thou hast much to suffer if thou wouldst take the part of the poor misshapen nutcracker. For the mouse king watches for him at every hole and corner. I cannot. Thou, thou alone canst rescue him. Be firm and true. Neither Maria nor any one else knew what Drosselmeyer meant by these words and they appeared so singular to Dr. Stahlbaum that he felt the counsellor's pulse and said, Worthy friend, you have some violent congestion about the head. I will prescribe something for you. But the mother shook her head thoughtfully and spoke. I feel what it is that the counsellor means, but I cannot express it in words. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 The Victory Not long after, Maria was awakened one moonlight night by a strange rattling that seemed to come out of a corner of the chamber. It sounded as if little stones were thrown and rolled about, and every now and then there was a terrible squeaking and squealing. Ah, the mice! The mice are coming again, exclaimed Maria in a fright. And she was about to wake her mother, but her voice failed her, and she could stir neither hand nor foot, for she saw the mouse king work his way out of a hole in the wall, then run, with sparkling eyes and crowns, around and around the chamber, when at last, with a desperate leap, he sprang upon the little table that stood close by her bed. 
Hi, hi, hi. Must give me thy sugar plums, thy gingerbread little thing, or I will bite thy nutcracker, thy nutcracker. So squeaked the mouse king and snapped and grated hideously with his teeth, then sprang down again and away through the hole in the wall. Maria was so distressed by this occurrence that she looked very pale in the morning and was scarcely able to say a word. A hundred times she was going to inform her mother or Louise of what had happened, or at least tell Fred. But she thought, no one will believe me and I shall only be laughed at. This, at least, was very clear, that if she wished to save little Nutcracker, she must give up her sugar plums and her gingerbread. So in the evening she laid all that she had, and she had a great deal, down before the foot of the glass case. The next morning her mother said, It is strange what brings the mice all at once into the sitting room. See, poor Maria, they have eaten up all your gingerbread. And so it was. The ravenous mouse king had not found the sugar plums exactly to his taste, but he had gnawed them with his sharp teeth, so that they had to be thrown away. Maria did not grieve about her cake and sugar plums, for she was greatly delighted to think that she had saved little Nutcracker. But what was her terror when the very next night she heard a squeaking and squealing close to her ear. Ah, the mouse king was there again, and his eyes sparkled more dreadfully, and he whistled and squeaked much louder than before. Must give me thy sugar puppets, chocolate figures, little thing, or I will bite thy nutcracker, thy nutcracker. And with this, the terrible mouse king sprang down and ran away again. Maria was very sad. She went the next morning to the glass case and gazed with the most sorrowful looks at her sugar and chocolate figures. And her grief was reasonable, for thou canst not imagine, my attentive reader, what beautiful figures of sugar and chocolate little Maria Stahlbaum possessed. A pretty shepherd and shepherdess watched a whole flock of milk-white lambs while a little dog frisked about them. Next came two letter carriers with letters in their hands, and then four neat pairs of nicely dressed boys and girls, with gay ribbons, rocked at seesaw upon as many boards, white and smooth as marble. Behind some dancers stood Farmer Carraway and the maid of Orleans. These Maria did not care so much about, but close in a corner stood her darling, a little red-cheeked baby, and now the tears came into her eyes. Ah, oh, dear Master Drosselmeyer, she said, turning to Nutcracker, there is nothing that I will not do to save you, but this is very hard. Nutcracker looked all the while so sorrowfully that Maria who felt as if she saw the Mouse King open his seven mouths to devour the unhappy youth, resolved to sacrifice them all. So at evening she placed all her sugar figures down at the foot of the glass case, just as she had done before with her sugar plums and cake. She kissed the shepherd and the shepherdess and the lambs, and at last took her darling, the little red-cheeked baby out of the corner and placed it down behind all the rest. Farmer Carraway and the maid of Orleans must stand in the first row. Well, that is too bad, said her mother the next morning. A mouse must have got into the glass case, for all poor Maria's sugar figures are gnawed and bitten in pieces. Maria could not keep from shedding tears, but she soon smiled again and said to herself, That is nothing if Nutcracker is only saved. In the evening, her mother told the counsellor of the mischief which the mouse had been doing in the glass case and said, 
It is provoking that we cannot destroy this fellow that makes such havoc with Maria's sugar toys. Ha! cried Fred merrily. The baker opposite has a fine grey secretary of legation. Suppose I bring him over. He will soon make an end of the thing. He will have the mouse's head off very quickly, even if it be Lady Mouserings herself or her son, the Mouse King. And jump about the tables and chairs, said his mother, laughing, and throw down cups and saucers and do all kinds of mischief. Ah, no, indeed, said Fred. The baker's secretary of legation is a light, careful fellow. I wish I could walk on the roof of a house as well as he. Let us have no cats in the night, said Louise, who could not bear them. Fred's plan is the best, said the doctor, but we will try a trap first. Have we got one? Godfather Drosselmeyer can make them best, said Fred, for he invented them. All laughed, and when the mother said that there was no mouse trap in the house, the counsellor assured her that he had a number in his possession, and immediately sent for one. In a short time it was brought, and a very excellent mouse trap it seemed to be. The story of the hard nut now came vividly to the minds of the children. As the cook toasted the fat, Maria shook and trembled. Her head was full of the story and its wonders, and she said to her old friend Dora, Ah, great queen, take care of Lady Mouserings and her family. But Fred had drawn his sword and cried, Let them come on, let them come on, I will scatter them. But all remained still and quiet under the hearth. As the counsellor tied the fat to a fine piece of thread and set the trap softly, softly down by the glass case, Fred cried out, Take care, Godfather Mechanist or Mouse King will play you a trick. Ah, but what a night did Maria pass. Something cold as ice tapped here and there against her arm and crept, rough, and hideous upon her cheek, and squeaked and squealed in her ear. The hateful Mouse King sat upon her shoulder. He opened his seven blood-red mouths, and grating and snapping his teeth, he squeaked and hissed in her ear. Wise Mouse, wise Mouse, goes not into the house, goes not to the feast, Likes sugar things best. Craft set at naught will not be caught. Give, give all new frock. Picture books all the best. Or shall have no rest. I will tear and bite. Nutcracker at night. Hi, hi, k k. Maria was full of sorrow and anxiety. She looked very pale and disturbed on the following morning when Fred told her that the mouse had not been caught so that her mother thought that she was grieving for her sugar things or perhaps was afraid of the mouse. Do not grieve, dear child, she said. We will soon get rid of him. If the trap does not answer, Fred shall bring his grey secretary of legation. As soon as Maria was alone in the sitting room, she stepped to the glass case and said, sobbing to Nutcracker, Ah, my dear, good Mr. Drosselmeyer, what can I, poor unhappy maiden, do? For if I should give up all my picture books and even my new beautiful frock to the hateful mouse, he will ask more and more. And when I have nothing left to give him, he will at last want me, instead of you, to bite in pieces. As little Maria grieved and sorrowed in this way, she observed a large spot of blood on Nutcracker's neck, which had been there ever since the battle. Now after Maria had known that her Nutcracker was young Drosselmeyer, the counsellor's nephew, she did not carry him any more in her arms, nor hug and kiss him as she used to do. Indeed, she would very seldom move or touch him. 
but when she saw the spot of blood she took him carefully from the shelf and commenced rubbing it with her pocket handkerchief but what was her astonishment when she felt that he suddenly grew warm in her hand and began to move she put him quickly back upon the shelf again when behold his little mouth began to work and twist and move up and down and at last with a great deal of labour he lisped out ah dearest best miss stalbaum excellent friend how shall i thank you no no picture books no christmas frock get me a sword a sword for the rest i here speech left him and his eyes which had begun to express the deepest sympathy became staring and motionless maria did not feel the least terror on the contrary she leaped for joy for she had now found a way to rescue nutcracker without any more painful sacrifices but where should she obtain a sword for him maria at last resolved to ask advice of fred and in the evening when their parents had gone out and they sat alone together in the chamber by the glass case she told him all that had happened to nutcracker and mouse king and then begged him to furnish the little fellow with a sword upon no part of this narration did fred reflect so long and so earnestly as upon the poor account which she gave him of the bravery of his hussars he asked once more very seriously if it were so maria assured him of it upon her word when fred ran quickly to the glass case addressed his hussars in a very moving speech and then as a punishment for their cowardice cut their military badges from their caps and forbade them for a year to play the hussars grand march after this he turned again to maria and said as to a sword i can easily supply the little fellow with one i yesterday permitted an old colonel of the cuirassiers to retire upon a pension and consequently he has no farther use for his fine sharp sabre the aforesaid colonel was living on the pension which fred had allowed him in the farthest corner of the third shelf he was brought out his fine silver sabre taken from him and buckled about nutcracker maria could scarcely get to sleep that night she was so anxious and fearful about midnight it seemed to her as if she heard a strange rustling and rattling and slashing in the sitting-room all at once it went queek the mouse king the mouse king cried maria and sprang in her fright out of bed all was still but presently she heard a gentle knocking at the door and a soft voice was heard worthiest best kindest miss stalbaum open the door without fear good tidings maria knew the voice of the young drosselmeyer so she threw her frock about her and opened the door little nutcracker stood without with a bloody sword in his right hand and a wax taper in his left as soon as he saw maria he bent down on one knee and said you o oh lady you alone it was that filled me with knightly courage and gave this arm strength to contend with the presumptuous foe who dared to disturb your slumber the treacherous mouse king is overcome he lies bathed in his blood. Scorn not to receive the tokens of victory from a knight who will remain devoted to your service until death. With these words, Nutcracker took off the seven crowns of the Mouse King, which he had hung upon his left arm, and reached them to Maria, who received them with great joy. Nutcracker then arose and said, best kindest miss stalbaum you know not what beautiful things i could show you at this moment while my enemy lies vanquished 
if you would have the condescension to follow me for a few steps, oh, will you not be so kind, will you not be so good, best, kindest, Miss Stahlbaum. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 The Puppet Kingdom I believe that none of you children would have hesitated for an instant to follow the good, honest nutcracker, who could never have meditated any evil. Maria consented to follow him, so much the more readily, because she knew what claims she had upon his gratitude, and because she was convinced that he would keep his word and show her many beautiful things. I will go with you, Master Drosselmeyer, she said, but it must not be far and it must not be long, for as yet I have hardly had any sleep. I will choose then, replied Nutcracker, the nearest, though a more difficult way. He went onward and Maria followed him, until he stopped before a large antique wardrobe which stood in the hall. Maria perceived, to her astonishment, that the doors of this wardrobe, which were always kept locked, now stood wide open, so that she could see her father's fox-furred travelling coat, which hung in front. Nutcracker clambered very nimbly up by the carved figures and ornaments, until he could grasp the large tassel which hung down the back of the coat, and was fastened to it by a thick cord. As soon as Nutcracker pulled upon the tassel, a neat little stairs of cedar wood stretched down from the sleeve of the travelling coat to the floor. Ascend, if you please, dearest miss, cried Nutcracker. Maria did so, but scarcely had she gone up the sleeve, scarcely had she seen her way out at the collar, when a dazzling light broke forth upon her, and all at once she stood upon a sweet-smelling meadow, surrounded by millions of sparks, which darted up like flashing jewels. We are now upon Candy Meadow, said Nutcracker, but we will directly pass through yonder gate. When Maria looked up, she saw the beautiful gate, which stood a few steps before them upon the meadow. It seemed built of variegated marble, of white, brown, and raisin colour, but when Maria came nearer, she perceived that the whole mass consisted of sugar, almonds, and raisins, kneaded and baked together, for which reason the gate, as Nutcracker assured her when they passed through it, was called the Almond and Raisin Gate. Upon a gallery built over the gate, made apparently of barley sugar there were six apes in red jackets who struck up the finest turkish music which was ever heard so that maria scarcely observed that they were walking onward and onward over a rich mosaic which was nothing else than a pavement of nicely inlaid lozenges very soon the sweetest odours streamed around them which were wafted from a wonderful little wood that opened on each side before them. There it shone and sparkled so among the dark leaves that the golden and silvery fruit could plainly be seen hanging from their gaily coloured stems, while the trunks and branches were ornamented with ribbons and nosegays, and when the orange perfume stirred and moved like a soft breeze, how it rustled among the boughs and leaves, and the golden fruit rocked and rattled in merry music, to which the bright dancing sparkles kept time. Ah, how delightful it is here, cried Maria, entranced in happiness. We are in Christmas wood, best miss, said Nutcracker. Ah, if I could but linger here a while, cried Maria. Oh, it is too, too charming. Nutcracker clapped his hands and some little shepherds and shepherdesses and hunters and huntresses came near, who were so delicate and white that they seemed made of pure sugar. They brought a dainty little armchair, all of gold, laid upon it a green cushion of candied citron and invited Maria very politely to sit down. 
She did so, and immediately the shepherds and shepherdesses danced a very pretty ballet, while the hunters very obligingly blew their horns, and then all disappeared again in the bushes. Pardon, pardon, kindest Miss Stalbaum, said Nutcracker. The dance was miserably performed, but the people all belong to our company of wire dancers, and they can do nothing but the same, same thing. They are deficient in variety. And the hunters blew so dull and lazily, but shall we not walk a little farther? Ah, it was all very pretty and pleased me very much, said Maria, as she rose and followed Nutcracker. They now walked along by a soft rustling brook, out of which all the sweet perfumes seemed to arise, which filled the whole wood. This is the orange brook, said Nutcracker, but its fine perfume accepted. It cannot compare, either in size or beauty, with Lemonade River, which, like it, empties into Orjet Lake. In fact, Maria very soon heard a louder rustling and dashing, and then beheld the broad Lemonade River, which rolled in proud cream-coloured billows between banks covered with bright green bushes. A refreshing coolness arose out of its noble waves. Not far off, a dark yellow stream dragged itself lazily along, but it gave forth a very sweet odour, and a great number of little children sat on the shore, angling for little fish, which they ate up as soon as caught. When Maria came nearer, she observed that these fish were shaped almost like peanuts. At a distance there was a very neat little village on the borders of this stream. Houses, churches, parsonages, barns were all dark brown, but many of the roofs were gilded, and some of the walls were painted so strangely that it seemed as if little sugar plums and bits of citron were stuck upon them. This is Gingerbreadville, said Nutcracker, which lies on Molasses River. Very pretty people live in it, but they are a little ill-tempered because they suffer a good deal from the toothache, and so we will not visit it. At this moment Maria observed a little town in which the houses were clear and transparent, and of different colours, which was a very pretty sight to look at. Nutcracker went straight forward towards it, and now Maria heard a busy merry clatter, and saw a thousand tiny little figures collected around some heavily laden wagons, which had stopped in the market. These they unloaded, and what they took out looked like sheets of coloured paper and chocolate cakes. We are now in Bonbon Town, said Nutcracker. An importation has just arrived from Paperland, and from King Chocolate. The poor people of Bonbon Town are often terribly threatened by the armies of Generals Fly and Nat, for which reason they fortify their houses with stout materials from Paperland, and throw up fortifications of the strong bulwarks, which King Chocolate sends to them. But worthiest Miss Stalbaum, we will not visit all the little towns and villages of this land, to the capital, to the capital. Nutcracker hastened forward, and Maria followed, full of curiosity. It was not long before a sweet odour of roses enveloped them, and everything around was touched with a soft, rose-coloured tint. Maria soon observed that this was the reflection of the red glancing lake, which rustled and danced before them, with charming and melodious tones in little rosy waves. Beautiful silver-white swans with golden collars swam over the lake singing sweet tunes, while little diamond fish dipped up and down in the rosy water, as if in the merriest dance. Ah, exclaimed Maria ardently, this is then the lake which Godfather Drosselmeyer was once going to make for me and I myself am the maiden who is to fondle and caress the dear swans. Nutcracker laughed in a scornful manner, such as Maria had never observed in him before, and then said, 
God, Father Drosselmeyer, can never make anything like this. You, you yourself, rather sweetest Miss Stahlbaum, but we will not trouble our heads about that. Let us sail across the Rose Lake to the capital. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 The Capital Nutcracker clapped his little hands together again. When the Rose Lake began to dash louder, the waves rolled higher, and Maria perceived a car of shells covered with bright, sparkling, gay-coloured jewels, moving toward them in the distance, drawn by two golden-scaled dolphins. Twelve of the loveliest little moors, with caps and aprons braided of hummingbirds' feathers, leaped upon the shore and carried first Maria and then Nutcracker with a soft gliding step over the waves and placed them in the car which straightway began to move across the lake. Ah, how delightful it was as Maria sailed along, with the rosy air and the rosy waves breathing and dashing around her. The two golden-scaled dolphins raised up their heads and spouted clear crystal streams out of their nostrils, high, high in the air, which fell down again in a thousand quivering, flashing rainbows and it seemed as if two small silver voices sang out. Who sails upon the rosy lake, the little fairy, awake, awake, music and song, bim, bim, fishes, sim, sim, swans, tweet, tweet, birds, whiz, whiz, breezes, rustling, ringing, singing, blowing, a fairy o'er the waves is going, rosy billows murmuring, playing, dashing, cooling the air, roll along, along. But the singing of the falling fountains did not seem to please the twelve little moors, who were seated up behind the car, for they shook their parasols so hard that the palm leaves of which they were made rattled and clattered, and they stamped with their feet in very strange time, and sang, Clap and clip and clip and clap, backward and forward, up and down. Moors are a merry folk, said Nutcracker, somewhat disturbed. But they will make the whole lake rebellious. And very soon there arose a confused din of strange voices, which seemed to float in the sea and in the air. But Maria did not heed them, for she was gazing in the sweet-scented rosy waves, out of which the face of a charming little maiden smiled up upon her. Ah! she cried joyfully, and struck her hands together. Look, look, dear Master Drosselmeyer, there is the Princess Pearlypat down in the water. Oh, how sweetly she smiles upon me. Nutcracker sighed quite sorrowfully and said, O oh, kindest Miss Stahlbaum, that is not the Princess Pearlypat. It is you. You. It is your own lovely face that smiles so sweetly out of the Rose Lake. Upon this, Maria drew her head back very quickly put her hands before her face and blushed very much. At this moment she was lifted out of the car by the twelve moors and carried to the shore. They now found themselves in a little thicket, which was perhaps more beautiful even than the Christmas wood. It was so bright and sparkling. What was most wonderful in it were the strange fruits that hung upon the trees, which were not only curiously coloured, but gave out also every kind of sweet odour. We are in Sweetmeat Grove, said Nutcracker, but yonder is the capital. And what a sight! How can I venture, children, to describe the beauty and splendour of the city, which now displayed itself to Maria's eyes, upon the broad, flowery meadow before them? Not only did the walls and towers glitter with the gayest colours, but the style of the buildings was like nothing else that is to be found in the world. 
Instead of roofs, the houses had diadems set upon them, braided and twisted in the daintiest manner. And the towers were crowned with variegated trellis work and hung with festoons, the most beautiful that ever were seen. As they passed through the gate, which looked as if it were built of macaroons and candied fruits, silver soldiers presented arms, and a little man in a brocade dressing gown threw himself upon Nutcracker's neck with the words, Welcome, best prince, welcome to Confectionville. Maria was not a little astonished to hear young Drosselmeyer called a prince by such a distinguished man but she now heard such a hubbub of little voices, such a huzzahing and laughter, such a singing and playing, that she could think of nothing else, and turned to Nutcracker to ask him what it all meant. O oh, worthiest Miss Stahlbaum, it is nothing uncommon. Confectionville is a populous and merry city, thus it goes here every day. Let us walk farther, if you please. They had only gone a few steps when they came to the great marketplace, which presented a wonderful sight. All the houses around were of sugared filigree work. Gallery was built over gallery, and in the middle stood a tall obelisk of white and red sugared cream, while four curious sweet fountains played in the air of orgeat, lemonade, mead and soda water and in the great basin were soft bruised fruits, mixed with sugar and cream, and touched a little by the frost. But prettier than all this were the charming little people, who, by thousands, pushed and squeezed, knocked their heads together, huzzahed, laughed, jested and sang, who had raised indeed that merry din which Maria had heard at a distance. Here were beautifully dressed men and women, Armenians and Greeks, Jews and Tyrolese, officers and soldiers, preachers, shepherds and harlequins, in short, all the people that can possibly be found in the world. On one corner the tumult increased, the people rocked and reeled to clear the way, for just at that moment the Grand Mogul was carried by in a palaquin, attended by ninety-three grandees of the kingdom, and seven hundred slaves. Now on the opposite corner, the fishermen, five hundred strong, were marching in procession, and it happened, very unfortunately, that the Grand Turk took it into his head just then to ride over the marketplace with three thousand janissaries, besides which a long train came from the festival of sacrifices with sounding music singing up and thank the mighty sun, and pushed straight on for the obelisk. Then what a squeezing and a pushing and a rattling and a clattering. By and by a screaming was heard, for a fisherman had knocked off a Brahmin's head in the crowd, and the great mogul was almost run over by a harlequin. The tumult grew wilder and wilder, and they had commenced to beat and strike each other, when the man in the brocade dressing gown, who had called Nutcracker a prince at the gate, clambered up by the obelisk, and having thrice pulled a little bell, called out three times, Confesseur, confesseur, confesseur. The tumult was immediately appeased. Each one tried to help himself as well as he could, and, after the confused trains and processions were set in order, and the dirt upon the great mogul's clothes was brushed off, and the Brahmin's head put on again. The former hubbub began anew. What do they mean by confesseur, good master Drosselmeyer? asked Maria. Ah, best Miss Stahlbaum, replied Nutcracker, by confesseur is meant an unknown but very fearful power, which they believe can do with them as he pleases. It is the fate that rules over this merry little people, and they fear it so much that the mere mention of the name is able to still the great tumult. Each one then thinks no longer of anything earthly, of cuffs and kicks and broken heads, but retires within himself and says, 
What are we, and what is our destiny? Maria could not refrain from a loud exclamation of surprise and wonder, as all at once they stood before a castle, glimmering with rosy light, and crowned with a hundred airy towers. Beautiful nosegays of violets, narcissuses, tulips, and dahlias were hung about the walls, and their dark glowing colours only heightened the dazzling rose-tinted white ground upon which they were fastened. The large cupola of the centre building and the sloping roofs of the towers were spangled with a thousand gold and silver stars. We are now in front of March Payne Castle, said Nutcracker. Maria was completely lost in admiration of this magic palace. Yet it did not escape her that one of the large towers was without a roof, while little men were moving around it upon a scaffolding of cinnamon, as if busied in repairing it. But before she had time to inquire about it, Nutcracker continued. Not long ago, this beautiful castle was threatened with serious injury, if not with entire destruction. The giant Sweet Tooth came this way and bit off the roof of yonder tower and was gnawing upon the great cupola when the people of Confectionville gave up to him a full quarter of the city and a considerable portion of Sweetmeat Grove as tribute, with which he contented himself and went his way. At this moment, soft music was heard, the doors of the palace opened, and twelve little pages marched out with lighted clothes, which they carried in their hands like torches. Each of their heads was a pearl, their bodies were made of rubies and emeralds, and they walked upon feet cast out of pure gold. Four ladies followed them, almost as tall as Maria's Clara but so richly and splendidly dressed that she saw in a moment that they were princesses born. They embraced Nutcracker in the tenderest manner and cried with joyful sobs, Oh, my prince, my best prince, oh, my brother. Nutcracker seemed very much moved. He wiped the tears out of his eyes, then took Maria by the hand and said with great emotion, this is Miss Maria Stahlbaum, the daughter of a much respected and very worthy physician, and she is the preserver of my life. Had she not thrown her shoe at the right time, had she not supplied me with the sword of a pensioned colonel, I should now be lying in my grave, torn and bitten to pieces by the terrible Mouse King. View her, gaze upon her, and tell me if Pearlypat, although a princess by birth, can compare with her in beauty, goodness, and virtue. No, I say, no. And all the ladies cried out, no, and then fell upon Maria's neck, exclaiming, Ah, dear preserver of the prince, our beloved brother, charming Miss Maria Stahlbaum. She now accompanied these ladies and Nutcracker into the castle and entered a room, the walls of which were of bright coloured crystal. But of all the beautiful things which Maria saw here, what pleased her most were the nice little chairs, sofas, secretaries and bureaus with which the room was furnished and which were all made of cedar or Brazil wood and ornamented with golden flowers. The princesses made Maria and Nutcracker sit down and said that they would immediately prepare something for them to eat. They then brought out a great many little cups and saucers and plates and dishes, all of the finest porcelain and spoons, knives and forks, graters, kettles, pans and other kitchen furniture, all of gold and silver. Then they brought the finest fruits and sugar things, such as Maria had never seen before, and began in the nicest manner to squeeze the fruits with their little snow-white hands, 
and to pound the spice and grate the sugar almonds. In short, so to turn and handle everything, that Maria could see how well the princesses had been brought up, and what a delicious meal they were preparing. As she desired very much to learn such things, she could not help wishing to herself that she might assist the princesses in their labour. The most beautiful of Nutcracker's sisters, as if she had guessed Maria's secret thoughts, reached her a little golden mortar, saying, O oh, sweet friend, dear preserver of my brother, will you not pound a little of this sugar candy? While Maria pounded in the mortar, Nutcracker began to give a full account of his adventures, of the dreadful battle between his army and that of the Mouse King, and how he had lost it by the cowardice of his troops how the terrible Mouse King lay in wait to bite him in pieces, and how Maria, to preserve him, gave up many of his subjects who had entered her service, and all just as it had happened. During this narration, it seemed to Maria as if his words became less and less audible, and the pounding of her mortar also sounded more and more distant, until she could scarcely hear it. Presently, she saw a silver gauze before her in which the princesses, the pages, Nutcracker and herself too, were all enveloped. A singular humming and rustling and singing was heard, which seemed to die away in the distance. And now Maria was raised up, as if upon mounting waves, higher and higher, higher and higher, higher and higher. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 The Conclusion Purr! Puff! It went. Maria fell down from an immeasurable height. That was a fall. But she opened her eyes and there she lay upon her little bed. It was bright day and her mother stood by her saying, How can you sleep so long? Breakfast has been ready this great while. You now perceive, kind readers and listeners, that Maria, completely confused by the wonderful things which she had seen, had at last fallen asleep in the room at Marchpane Castle, and that the Moors, or the pages, or perhaps even the princesses themselves, must have carried her home and laid her softly in bed. Oh, mother, dear mother! You cannot think where young Master Drosselmeyer led me last night and what beautiful things I have seen. And then she began and told the whole almost as accurately as I have related it, while her mother listened in astonishment. When she had finished, her mother said, You have had a long and very beautiful dream, but now drive it all out of your head. Maria insisted upon it that she had not dreamed, but had actually seen what she had related. When her mother led her into the sitting room, to the glass case, took Nutcracker out, who was standing as usual upon the second shelf, and said, Silly child, how can you believe that this wooden Nuremberg puppet can have life or motion? But dear mother, replied Maria, I know little Nutcracker is young Master Drosselmeyer of Nuremberg, Godfather Drosselmeyer's nephew. Then her father and mother both laughed very heartily. Ah, dear father, said Maria, almost crying, you should not laugh so at my Nutcracker. He has spoken very well of you. For when we entered Marchpane Castle, and he presented me to his sisters, the princesses, he said that you were a much respected and very worthy physician. At this the laughter was still louder, and Louise and even Fred joined in. Maria then ran into the other chamber, took the seven crowns of the Mouse King out of her little box, brought them in, and handed them to her mother, saying, See here, dear mother, here are the seven crowns of the Mouse King, which young Master Drosselmeyer gave me last night as a token of his victory. Her mother examined the little crowns in great astonishment. 
They were made of a strange but very shining metal, and were so delicately worked that it seemed impossible that mortal hands could have formed them. Her father, likewise, could not gaze enough at them, and he insisted very seriously that Maria should confess how she obtained them. But she could give no other account of them, and kept firm to what she had said. And as her father spoke very harshly to her, and even called her a little storyteller, she began to cry bitterly and said, Oh, what, what then shall I say? At this moment the door opened. The counsellor entered and exclaimed, What's this, what's this? The doctor told him of all that had happened and showed him the little crowns. As soon as the counsellor cast his eyes on them, he laughed and cried, Stupid pack, stupid pack, these are the very crowns which I used to wear on my watch chain years ago, and which I gave to little Maria on her birthday when she was two years old. Don't you remember them? Neither father nor mother could remember them, but when Maria saw that her parents had forgotten their anger, she ran to Godfather Drosselmeyer and said, Ah, you know all about it, Godfather Drosselmeyer. Tell them yourself that my nutcracker is your nephew, young Master Drosselmeyer of Nuremberg, and that it was he who gave me the crowns. The counsellor's face turned very dark and grave, and he muttered, Stupid pack, stupid pack. Upon this, the doctor took little Maria upon his knee and said very seriously, Listen to me, Maria. Once for all, drive your foolish dreams and nonsense out of your head. If I ever hear you say again that the silly, ugly nutcracker is the nephew of your godfather Drosselmeyer, I will throw him out of the window and all the rest of your puppets. Miss Clara not excepted. Poor Maria durst not now speak of all these wonders, but she thought so much the more. Her whole soul was full of them, for you may imagine that things so fine and beautiful as those which she had seen are not easily forgotten. Even Fred turned his back upon his sister whenever she spoke of the wonderful kingdom in which she had been so happy, and it is said that he sometimes would mutter between his teeth, Silly goose! But that I can hardly believe of so amiable and good-natured a fellow. This is certain, however, he no longer believed a word of what Maria had told him. He made a formal apology to his hussars on public parade for the injustice which he had done them. Stuck in their caps feathers of goose quill, much finer and taller than those of which they had been deprived, and permitted them again to blow the hussar's grand march. Aha! We know best how it stood with their courage when those hateful balls spotted their red coats. Maria was not allowed then to speak of any more of her adventures, but the images of that wonderful fairy kingdom played about her in sweet, rustling tones. She could bring them all back again whenever she fixed her thoughts steadfastly upon them. And hence it came that instead of playing as she formerly did, she would sit silent and thoughtful, musing within herself for which reason the rest would often scold her and call her a little dreamer. Sometime after this, it happened that the counsellor was busy repairing a clock in Dr. Stahlbaum's house. Maria sat close by the glass case, and lost in her dreams was gazing at Nutcracker, when the words broke from her lips involuntarily. Ah, dear Master Drosselmeyer, if you actually were living, I would not behave like Princess Pearlypat and slight you, because for my sake you had ceased to be a handsome young man. At this the counsellor screamed, Hey, hey, stupid pack! Then there was a clap and a knock, so loud that Maria sank from her chair in a swoon. When she came to herself, 
her mother was busied about her and said, How came such a great girl to fall from her chair? Here is Godfather Drosselmeyer's nephew, just arrived from Nuremberg. Come, behave like a little woman. She looked up. The counsellor had put on his glass wig again and his brown coat. He was smiling very pleasantly, and he held by the hand a little but very well-shaped young man. His face was as white as milk and as red as blood. He wore a handsome red coat, trimmed with gold and shoes and white silk stockings. In his buttonhole was stuck a nosegay. His hair was nicely powdered and curled, and down his back there hung a magnificent queue. The sword by his side seemed to be made of nothing but jewels. It flashed and sparkled so brightly, and the little hat which he carried under his arm looked as if it were overlaid with soft silken flakes. It very soon appeared how polite and well-bred the young man was, for he had brought Maria a great many handsome playthings. The nicest gingerbread and the same sugar figures which the Mouse King had bitten to pieces. And for Fred, he had brought a splendid sabre. At table, the little fellow cracked nuts for the whole company. The hardest could not resist him. With the right hand, he put them in his mouth. With the left, he pulled hard upon his cue, and crack, the nut fell in pieces. Maria had turned very red when she first saw the handsome young man, and she became still redder when, after dinner, young Drosselmeyer invited her to go with him into the sitting room to the glass case. Play prettily together, children. I have nothing against it since all my clocks are going, cried the counsellor. Scarcely was Maria alone with young Drosselmeyer when he stooped upon one knee and said, Oh, my very best, Miss Stalbaum, you see here at your feet the happy Drosselmeyer, whose life you saved on this very spot. You said most amiably that you would not slight me like the hateful Princess Pearlypat if I had become ugly for your sake. From that moment I ceased to be a miserable nutcracker and resumed again my old, and, I hope, not disagreeable figure. O oh, excellent Miss Stalbaum, make me happy with your dear hand. Share with me crown and kingdom. Rule with me in Marchpane Castle, for there I am still king. Maria raised the youth and said softly, Dear Master Drosselmeyer, you are a kind, good-natured young man, and, since you rule in such a charming land among such pretty, merry people, I will be your bride. With this, Maria immediately became Drosselmeyer's betrothed bride. After a year and a day he came, as I have heard, and carried her away in a golden chariot, drawn by silver horses. There danced at the wedding two and twenty thousand of the most splendid figures, adorned with pearls and diamonds, and Maria, it is said, is at this hour queen of a land where sparkling Christmas woods, transparent marchpane castles, in short, where the most beautiful, the most wonderful things can be seen by those who will only have eyes for them. End of Nutcracker and Mouse King by E.T.A. Hoffman Were you surprised? The first time I listened to this, I really was surprised. I expected the end to be the Wizard of Oz movie. The, oh, it was just a dream and you were there and you were there and you, you know, but no, 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 no. The real world held nothing for Maria except scolding parents and boring clockworks everything interesting was in this other world with this strange little nutcracker dude i also thought it was interesting though that the 
the good girl thing that is a vibe that I always got from the the ballet. Oh, you're supposed to be a good girl. Here, I didn't find that so much. It's not enough to tell a kid to be virtuous. In this situation, she has to do good. She has to prove that she's good, that she's worthy. And she does. And that's why I think it's so hard now to watch the old Disney films where the the princess, the heroine that the girl is supposed to be identifying with is passive. Maria is not passive. I love it. And this was written a long time ago. So yeah, every once in a while, I will see people make kind of blanket comments online. Of course, it's online about, you know, oh, well, back then when fill in the blank, nobody respected women. <laughs> women did have pockets, though. Uh, women were never taken seriously in art or literature. The vast majority, sure. But interestingly enough, a lot of the stories that we have read and listened to on Craftlet over the last 17 years the classics, the ones you're supposed to read in high school, or the ones that you think you know because you saw the movie version or a graphic novel version. These are stories where we really do find fabulous female characters, too. Right now, we've got Milady in The Three Musketeers. And if you are interested in listening to that, if you aren't already, we will be linking out in the show notes so that you can go to the very first episode of The Three Musketeers and start there. We also had the book The Woman in White back in 2011, I think, is when we started it. Uh, Marion, one of the most amazing ninja characters ever, is a chick with a gorgeous body, but not such a great face. She's, she's an interesting fantastic character and the flying hussars that i mentioned in the first episode or the winged hussars that i mentioned in the first episode i only learned about them because there was a reference to them in hg wells war of the worlds it was a sub-reference like you just were supposed to know who the hussars were and i went down that rabbit hole and went oh my gosh these guys are amazing um that was a premium book though so we'll we'll link out to war of the worlds from the show notes uh, with this episode as well, in case you are looking for a little science fiction. We need to do more of that on Craftlet. Maybe it's time for some Jules Verne. I haven't announced yet what our next book is going to be. We are coming into the home stretch for The Three Musketeers. We should be done with it by the end of January, beginning of February. So if you have ideas for what you think the next Craftlet book should be, Add to the conversation here or over in the group on Facebook. You can always leave comments in the show notes. You can email heather at craftlit.com. Let me know what you think. Just remember, if you are suggesting books, that they have to be in the public domain. And if they aren't on LibriVox.org, then... I'll need to find somebody who can read for us. And Maya Daguerre cannot be responsible for reading every book on the planet as much as we would all like that. So if you have any suggestions, please share. And if you're interested in doing some reading for the podcast, share that too. All right, that is the end of the 12 Days of Craftlet for you. I hope your Christmas is merry and bright. I hope your New Year's is marvelous and magical and has no seven-headed mice in it and and i hope 2024 is a better year take care of yourself i'll talk to you soon bye hi this is audio only heather i've now finished recording all of the 12 days of craft lit and that means that some of those episodes have been released so far I just wanted to put out a special thank you 
to everyone who's listened to the 12 Days of Craft Lit and then has gone to craftlit.gumroad with an M as in Mary.com or to our Etsy store, Relentlessly Curious, or to craftlit.com and followed links to the two different shops we have there. During the pandemic, I made a decision to change all of the prices on the annotated audiobooks, the just the books and the notes versions of the premium books that we had done over on Patreon and on the app's premium feed. I changed the prices to pay what you like, which means whatever the audio is worth to you, if you can pay that, that's great. Obviously, during the pandemic, I did it because life was hard and I thought people needed something different, something to listen to that wasn't part of our current crazy world. And that worked fine, but I've never seen responses like I've seen from you. You have made the 12 Days of Craft Lit very, very special for me and for Eric. And it's been a rough year with long COVID and unemployment. So I just wanted to say thank you, a big, huge thank you, and encourage you if there are public domain books that you would like to have done on Craft Lit and you're interested in reading, get a hold of me, heather at craftlit.com, and let's see what we can do. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that craftlit lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome makers and readers and people who hadn't been readers before, but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.